Wow, that was beautiful. Thanks, guys. And it's a, it's a great introduction to what we're looking at today. I want to thank Brian, too, for the, the kids' story, because it lays the foundation of, of what we're looking at. And it's the story of Nehemiah. And I love the story, because if you're 5 or 95, above or below, or anywhere in between, there's a message that Nehemiah has for us. And I think it's summed up in this quote um, by a pastor from the U.S. called T.D. Jakes. And I'll share it with you once the PowerPoint is up. But um, T.D. Jakes said this, If you can't figure out your purpose, figure out your passion. Your passion will lead you right into your purpose. If you can't figure out your purpose, figure out your passion, because your passion will lead you right into your purpose. In 2007, there was a presidential campaign going on in the US. Barack Obama was running for president, and there was a man who was with him every single day of that campaign. He was with him. He got up before him. He went to bed after him. He was by his side the whole time. He played basketball with him. He went to every campaign that Obama was at. He had a backpack on him, and in that backpack was Obama's favorite snacks, his favorite water. He was Obama's office works. He was Obama's um, vending machine. He was his, his body man this guy who was always with him. And he says this, as his personal aide, Reggie Love, you can see him there, he's this guy here. Um, There's him and and the um, Secret Security Service, Secret Service always around President Obama. He said this, I was his DJ, his Kindle, his travel agent, his valet, his daughter's basketball coach, his messenger, his punching bag, his alarm clock, his vending machine, his chief of stuff, his note passer, his spades partner, his party planner, his workout partner, his caterer, his small forward, his buffer, his gatekeeper, his surrogate son, and ultimately, improbably, and luckily, his friend. Reggie was with Barack every day, He slept in the room next to him. He woke up before him. He was there with him the whole time. And I share that because I think that gives us a glimpse into what Nehemiah's life was like. He was the the butler. He was the, the wine taster. He was the canary in the coal mine for Artaxerxes. And essentially, when we think of a, a cup bearer, we think of someone who their job is to taste the food, taste the drink, Wait five minutes. If they're still alive, pass it on to the king. If they're not, let's get a different menu in here because there's something wrong with that one. We kind of think that was what his role was. And that was, but it was more than that. Because he was there, whenever the king wanted food, Nehemiah had to be there to try it. And so he was close in proximity to the king. He was always around out of Xerxes. So when there were special private conversations happening, Nehemiah would have been there. When there was discussions taking on about what was happening in the kingdom, Nehemiah would have been there. When it was just Artaxerxes with his family, Nehemiah would have been there. So just like Reggie was to Obama, so Nehemiah was to Artaxerxes. He was like a gatekeeper, a lifeguard, a barman, a servant, a gourmet connoisseur. He listened to all these privileged conversations But that also meant he was in a position that was quite influential. He had the king's ear. He was probably well compensated for it. And he was well respected. It was a prestigious role that he had. And on top of all that, he wasn't even a native of that country. He was a Jew. He was a captive. But he held this place of respect and trust with the king. And one day, as you know, the story goes, if you've got your Bibles, open up to Nehemiah chapter 1. One day, Nehemiah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, he says, I was in the citadel of Susa. And Hanani, 
One of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. He wants to know, hey, what's going on back home? How are things? How is the people? How's the city? What's happening? And the report he gets isn't good. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Now, Nehemiah, a man of um, dignity in a respected position, a man who has the ear of the king, who's always got to hold himself together in all these moments, he hears this. And what's his reaction? When I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. Can you imagine a guy of his, of his status just falling on his knees and starting to weep? See, the city that he's from is in disgrace. And this wasn't just any city. This was the city that God chose to represent his name to the nations. And Nehemiah hears what it's like there. He hears that the people are being treated unfairly. He hears that the, the, the walls of the city, which are rep- represent its strength and its power and its protection, they're falling down. There's no gates to keep them safe. This city is in disgrace. And as a consequence, God's name is in disgrace as well. And he hears that and he just breaks. This news shatters him because he has a heart for his city and he has a heart for his God. And it's not like he heard about it and, and, met, and, and he weeps, but then two hours later he's like, okay, that's out of the system, let's move on. It says, for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. This wasn't just some passing little thing that disturbed him. This ate at his heart. This weighed him down. And the easiest way I can think of describe it is, is it just wrecked him. So I want to ask you a question. What disgrace, what dishonor, dishonor to God's name, what brokenness do you see around you that when you, when you hear about it, when you see it, you respond the same way that Nehemiah did when he heard about Jerusalem? He just go. That is not right. You know, there are some things that we see in the news or we talk about with people and, and we go, man, that's, that's no good. <laughs> that's not a great thing. But there are other things when we hear about it, our hearts just break and we go, that is not right. That is not the way it should be. That shouldn't be happening. That is not fair. That is not just. That is not kind. That is not loving. That does not honor God's name. That's not Okay those things that just break you down and you just want to weep because that's not the way it should be. What are those things that differentiate themselves from every other bad thing in the world that make your heart burn? They do that because I think God uses those things that wreck our heart to get us to actually do something about it. If your heart breaks for something, could it be? Could it be that God has given that to you so that you can actually go and do something about it? So that you can make a difference and play a role in doing some healing in the brokenness that you see around you? I think of it as holy heartburn. It's, heartburn is not a pleasant thing. It makes you feel uncomfortable. It makes you feel agitated. You want to get rid of it. But a holy heartburn is this, this God-given discontent inside of you that things shouldn't stay the way that they are. Something has to change. And I think God gives that to us to leverage that discontent, that holy divine discontent to get us to actually do something about it. A, a pastor explained it this way, and I'm completely going to plagiarize the way they illustrate it because I think it makes so much sense. Do you remember... Uh, a while ago now, there was a cartoon about a sailor man. You know the one? 
Popeye. So Popeye was this, this character. I don't know how he ever got his T-shirts on. His forearms were incredibly disproportionately large to the rest of his body. He was generally a pretty meek and mild-mannered guy. Unless something happened to the love of his life, the apple of his eye, who was olive oil, yeah. To Popeye, olive oil was his world, and he loved her, but things didn't always work out well, because there was one other character in this cartoon. Do you remember his name? Brutus, yes. A big brute of a man who would try and take olive oil away from Popeye. And when this happens, Popeye would let it go until it got to a point and he would say, that's all I can stand, I can't stand no more. And he would pop a can of spinach, kids, eat your greens, it's good for you. That's probably the only part of the story that you need to take home today. He would pop a can of spinach his massive forearms would get even bigger and then him and Brutus would go at it. And Popeye always won. He would sometimes get a few cuts and bruises, but this, this passion he had for olive oil, when it got to a certain point, he would have his moment, he'd pop his spinach, he'd get at Brutus and he'd get, that's it, this has got to stop now, this isn't going to go on any further. He'd have his little Popeye moment and then at the end he'd say, I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. Do you remember the, how the song goes? Stronger than any man. I. Yep. I, as I, I eat my spinach, I fight to the finish. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. Thank you. Yes. I wasn't sure if that would work, but it did. Thank you. <clears throat> but that's what's happening with Nehemiah. He's having his Popeye moment. He says, that's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. Something's got to be done about this situation. So what disgrace, what dishonor, what wrong is happening in the world which you see and you go, hey, this, this can't continue. Someone's got to do something about this. There was a young man who went to visit his brothers on the front line and In the enemy, there was a guy who was disgracing his God. And he said, hey, that's not right. I can't stand that no more. And so he went, he picked up those stones, he put them in his sling. And you know the rest of the story. David was 12, 13, 14 years old. He was young. There's no limit on age when it comes to finding your purpose. Gary Haugen was a recent law graduate who's working for the U.S. State Department. And in 1994, he he took some time out to go to Rwanda. And his job there was to work for the United Nations and direct their investigation into the genocide. His task was to gather the preliminary evidence that would then be used to take this horrible situation um, to the war crimes tribunal. He spoke with survivors. He talked to witnesses. He went and visited the mass graves where these horrible atrocities took place. And after six weeks, he came home and he he wasn't the same. After all the, the cruelty that he'd heard, that he'd seen, that he'd experienced... He came home disoriented, and he was distraught. These people have been treated this way. And and there was nobody who seemed to be standing up for them, nobody who was willing to do something for these people, and especially no Christian organization. And so he he said, "I, I can't stand it no more. Yes, Christians need to pray for these situations, but sometimes prayer and a lawyer helps. And so he founded the International Justice Mission. And their, their mandate is to represent the people who are abused, who are neglected, who are poor in other countries, 
who have no way of representing themselves in their legal systems. And to this point, they're operating in 13 countries, have 22 officers, and they, they've helped over 28,000 people who have no voice in the court systems. They've given them a voice and given them a chance to be heard, freed, compensated, helped. On Friday, I was at Edinburgh College and the, the year twos were taking, taking chapel and they shared this story of a lady called Layla. As a young girl, Layla was living in Bosnia she lived, grew up in a poor family, and they were so poor that when her shoes wore out, her dad put plastic bags around her feet and tied them up so she could walk to school in the snow. One Christmas, she received a shoebox-sized gift from the school as part of, part of Operation Christmas Child. And when she opened it up, inside were a pair of brand new shoes that fit her perfectly. She got those shoes, she wore them, and when she grew up, she was able to move to the States. And, and she had this realization that what she had experienced, other kids also needed to experience as well. They needed to have something to look forward to. They needed hope. They needed someone perhaps on the other side of the world who cared enough to fill a shoebox with a few things and send it out. And so now every year with her family, they put together 1,500 shoeboxes to send out to kids who need hope and shoes. Lou Nai Nai, Grandma Lou, uh, a lady that by all accounts, we would say was destitutely poor. Her and her husband would go through rubbish tips in China to pick out the recycling, and they would take that to a recycling center and get paid. But as she was going through the garbage and the trash, she would find babies that had just been dumped. Other people would just walk past it as if it was another piece of trash. But she couldn't. And so she would take these babies up. She took her first one in, a little girl. She found lying amongst, amongst the junk. She took her home and she cared for her. And at that point, she had her Popeye moment. She said, these children need love and care. They're all precious lives. I realized that if we had enough strength to collect garbage, how could we not recycle something as important as human lives? And so over 40 years, she rescued 30 babies, taking the last one in when she was 82 years old. You know, these are people who had their Popeye moment and said, this isn't right, something's got to be done about this. And so what is it for you? What is it that you've witnessed, that you see, that you experience? What is it that breaks your heart? What's your holy heartburn? See, Nehemiah, discovered his. And when you discover it, that's one thing. But what are you going to do about it is the next question. Because you can be passionate about something and still sit on the couch. But Nehemiah presents, I think, a master class in what to do when you have holy heartburn. How do you deal with it? Well, he starts off by not ignoring it, by not putting his head in the sand. He actually leans into it. Have a look at what it says. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So he could have easily just gone, man, that's not good. But I'm pretty comfy here. Someone will sort it out. Instead, he, he leans into it. He embraces it. He engages with it for days. You know, Ecclesiastes 3 says there's, there's a time for mourning. There's a time for joy. There's a time for crying. There's a time for sowing. There's a plant time for reaping. There's a time to actually sit in that burn and embrace it. Because if God is stirring your heart, there's a good chance he wants and he's got a plan to do something about it. 
And that's the second thing that Nehemiah does. He talks to God about it. Have a listen to this prayer that he prays. Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We've acted wickedly towards you. We've not obeyed your commands, decrees, and the laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you're unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if you are exiled, people are at the farthest horizon, which they were, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hands. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. He acknowledges they didn't get it. He acknowledges they they messed up. But his prayer is, I want to do something about this, but I'm not going to do it unless you're in it. I'm not stepping out on my own. I'm only stepping out if you're going to be a part of this. And so that's what he does. He leans into it. He talks to God about it. And then he steps out into it. I love this bit because for four months, four months, he's thinking about this. Four months, he's praying about this. Four months, he's thinking, God, what do you want me to do with this heartburn you've given me? Last night, I was chatting to a a lady. She's 41 years old. She's a midwife. And she feels that God might be calling her to go and study medicine. She feels that God wants her to make a different contribution. And she's in this space that Nehemiah was in during those four months. She's contemplating it. She's praying about it. She's thinking, God, is this what you want me to do? That's where Nehemiah was. Have a look at how he records this. The end of chapter 1, he says, I was cupbearer to the king. And then beginning of chapter 2. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. They were obviously having some kind of banquet or festivity, and he was doing his job, which was to bring the wine, taste it, make sure it's okay, which it was. He, bring the, he brings the wine to the king. But... He's sad. And Artaxerxes, is a, he's got a high EQ. He sees Nehemiah and he recognizes that something isn't okay. So, Nehemiah says, I've not been sad in his presence before. And that's a risky thing to do. Because if you're the king and someone's sad and you don't want them to be sad... Well, they're not going to be sad any longer. They're not going to be happy any longer. They're not going to be anything any longer. They're going to be gone. So he's risking a lot by showing his true emotion. But he goes in sad before the king. And the king says, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but a sadness of the heart. That's pretty perceptive. This can be nothing but a sadness of the heart. And that's true. Nehemiah is sad. His heart is breaking. The king asks him why. And Nehemiah says, I was very much afraid. And rightly so. He knew the consequences for being sad in front of the king, but he also knew that this was a now or never kind of moment. He can either tell the king what's really going on, or he can pretend like nothing's wrong. Remember, he's, he's leaned into this. He's talked to God about it. Now's the time for him to step out into it. So, with fear, right there, filling him up, he takes a step out because faith is stronger than fear. And he lays it all out. 
He says, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? I've done it. It's out. What happens now is whatever happens. But then, Artaxerxes says, well, what do you want? How can I help? What's going on? What can I do? And so Nehemiah says, all right, let's go. Let's, let's just lay it all out there. Let's have a crack and see what happens. And so he says, I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, hmm, how long will your journey take and when will you be back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, he realized, look, okay, we got past the first one. Let's just go for broke. Let's see what happens. Who knows? And so he says, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he'll give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. I imagine he's holding his breath here going, have I gone too far? Was it too much? Over the top? Artaxerxes. Well, he agrees. Because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. So I went to the governor of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. And the king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. He got long service leave. He got travel documents. And he got the king's Bunnings account. He had everything he needed to complete his mission. Now, if he was wondering, God, is this holy heartburn something from you? That's confirmation. If he was wondering, God, do you want me to do something about this? That's confirmation. But it required him stepping out into it first. He had to do something about it. It wasn't just given to him on a platter. You know, there's an even greater example of holy heartburn. Think of what Jesus did. The heartburn that he had inside of him was, there are people who are disconnected from God. And that's not okay. I want to see them reconciled with God. I want to see them back in a a tight relationship with him. Something has to happen. This brokenness isn't okay. And so he came down and he leaned into that heartburn. He talked to God about it regularly. It was a daily thing that he, when he was on earth, that he talked to God. God, this is this is what you sent me to do. I want to do it properly. And he stepped that into it. You know, that Garden of Gethsemane experience that he had. He he was leaning into it heavily. He was talking to God about it, and he had a choice then: Am I going to step out into this or not? And I'm so grateful he said yes. I'm so grateful he did that. Jesus takes Nehemiah's master class of what to do with holy heartburn and he just takes it to a whole other level. You know, and you hear these stories and you think, it sounds pretty simple. It sounds pretty easy. You read the rest of Nehemiah, man, he had his challenges. It was tough going. But because he had clarity about what he was called to do and he was passionate about it, he was able to overcome those hurdles. Jesus' life was not rainbows and unicorns. It was, it was immeasurably difficult. But he had a God-given purpose that he was there to fulfill. And because he knew that, and because he knew the God who called him to do it, he could push through with it. 
So what's yours? What's your holy heartburn and what are you going to do about it? You know, some of you might never have considered this question. You've never felt that burn inside of you that, hey, this is something God has called me to do. I want to, be, I want to get engaged with this. I want to do something about it. So I want to challenge you to think about what you see going on around you. What is it that you see that you say, hey, that's not right, that's not okay, something's got to be done. It might be in your community, it might be in your neighborhood, it might be in your family, it might be something broader in our country, it may be a a voice that needs to be heard, a stance that should be taken, it could be about food, it could be about um, shelter, it could be about poverty, the disadvantaged, the sick, the unwell, the debt-laden, the spiritually overlooked, What is it that burns inside of you? What is it that's not okay? And when you discover that, be willing to lean into it. Don't ignore it. Spend some time, as uncomfortable as it is, spend some time with that so God can clarify what it is he wants you to do. Others here know what it feels like to be on fire. For 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you've... You've felt that passion that God's placed inside your heart. You go, this is what he's called me to do. I'm passionate about this. I'm engaged in it. I can make a difference. But somewhere along the way, you got onto the bench. You jumped onto the sidelines and that fire seems to have gone out. It's not there anymore. You're kind of coasting through life. can I remind you that God wants to use you? That God wants to get you, put your shoes back on, tie up your laces and get you back into the game of making a difference in the world. Others of you, you found that heartburn. You're engaged in it right now. And every morning you wake up with that fire going, God, thank you for giving this to me today. May you use me to make a continued difference in the world for you. And if that is you, keep going. Keep at it. Don't let that fire burn out. Don't let it go down. Because you know that God is using you to make a difference in this world. I love this quote by Ellen White. She says, I've seen that those who live for a purpose, seeking to benefit others and bless their fellow men and to honor and glorify their Redeemer, are truly the happy ones on earth. Imagine what it would be like if we all followed Nehemiah's footsteps, if we all followed Jesus' footsteps, if the person sitting behind you, in front of you, to your left and to your right, if each one of us found what it is that God, it's placed in our hearts. If we discovered that holy heartburn, we leaned into it, we talked to him about it, and then we had the courage to actually step out into it. What transformation could God do in our communities, in our church, in our country, if we were willing to do that? What could he do in us and through us to heal brokenness? to restore relationships, to cover disgrace and to make a change for his glory.